This is Larry Moore. I'd like to welcome you back to uh, uh, our biological wastewater treatment training series. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of these. I hope it's been helpful to you. Um, we'll continue with presentation number seven today. We'll be talking about activated sludge process control. Now, I know many of you who uh, work with the Department of Energy, your uh, biological wastewater treatment is not your forte and, and learning how to control the activated sludge process in one training session is gonna be a real challenge, but I'm gonna try to give you a, a good overview of what we do to control the process to make it work like we want it to. All right, we're gonna go through some introductory slides that I'll introduce the uh, topic today. And then we'll get into the ways we actually control the process and uh, show you how we do that and how we actually apply what we call pressure to the process uh, to get the process uh, where we want it to be. And when we talk about controlling the activated sludge process, what we basically mean is that we're trying to make the sludge manageable so that we produce effluent quality that consistently meets our NPDES effluent permit requirements. So that's our main goal, to have a sludge that is manageable and that produces excellent effluent quality. Well, one of the things that we, we've got to do is, is, is we've got to know our plant. We've got to know our hydraulic loadings. What, what, what is the average daily flow rate that the plant is designed for? What's the peak daily flow rate the plant's designed for? What is the organic loading in pounds per day of BOD uh, that the plant is designed for? What's the suspended solids loading uh, design capacity of the plant? How much ammonia nitrogen is the plant designed for? Um, also in the nutrient loading, how much nitrogen is coming in in the raw wastewater in pounds per day? And, how much phosphorus is coming in, in in the raw wastewater in pounds per day. Again, we normally deal in concentrations in milligrams per liter, but it's more important to us as a design engineer and as one operating the plant, we've got to know those loadings in, in terms of mass, pounds per day, and that's more important to us. And we have to have concentration and flow rate in order to be able to come up with those mass loadings. And the reason we have to know those mass loadings because we see where we are compared to our design loadings. Are we way underloaded? Are we near capacity? Are we over capacity? Are we in danger of violating our permit? And, and do we have a problem with interferences or uh, do we have a situation where we're spending too much money operating the plant because of uh, the loading conditions? We have to know our plant operations. What are our basin capacities? We have to know an operator or one evaluating activated sludge process needs to know the volume of each of the tanks in the process. We know, need to know the, the way we can direct flow through the treatment plan and how we can return uh, sludge uh, and how we can return uh, side streams from sludge processing. So we gotta know how we're able to control flow through the treatment plant. Uh, and then we've got to know what our process control tools are. We'll talk about several of those that are available to us and how we use those to manipulate the process. And then there are a number of tests that we can use to give us data that tell us how the activated sludge process is, is performing. And those tests are absolutely critical for us because again, they give us the information to help us make decisions about process control. Again, we need to know basin capacities and flow rates. If we have EQ basins, um, most municipal wastewater treatment plants do not have EQ basins in the United States. And, and that's a disadvantage in that uh, if we have high hydraulic loadings, then uh, we don't have a way to smooth out those loadings. But if we do have EQ basins, that's a nice feature for us. It gives us some capability to handle uh, hydraulic loadings uh, when they get really high. We may or may not have primary clarifiers. Uh, many conventional activated sludge processes will have primary clarifiers. 
and we depend upon the primary clarifiers to reduce the BOD and suspended solids loading on the activated sludge process. On the other hand, if we're talking about extended aeration activated sludge, uh, uh, oxidation ditches, extended air, sequencing batch reactors, we almost always, uh, uh, we almost never, we almost never use uh, a primary clarifier for those extended aeration systems. We don't need it because the incoming suspended solids loading is probably only about 5% or 10% of the solids inventory we're carrying in our uh, biological reactors. Uh, so in an extended aeration activated sludge process, we hardly ever will have a primary clarifiers. But as we look at the activated sludge process, as we mentioned in previous presentation, the aeration basins and final clarifiers operate together. They work together. We get our soluble pollutant removal and our particulate pollutant removal in the biological reactors, but we have to be able to settle the biomass in the secondary clarifier to make the process work. So they they go hand in hand and they must work together to achieve the goals that we have in the activated sludge process. We're very um, concerned about our return activated sludge pumping rate, our waste activated sludge pumping rate. And I think I've given you a general guide. The RAS rate typically will be 20% of the influent flow rate to as much as 150% or more of the influent flow rate. The WAS pumping rate typically will be only about 0.5% to 3% of the raw wastewater flow rate. So those pumping rates are extremely important and the ability to be able to pump RAS and WAS uh, allows us to uh, control the process. As far as flow possibilities, again, we may be able to operate in different modes of operation depending upon how the plan is designed. We'll talk more about that later and the recycle options. If we, uh, we may be able to recycle mixed liquor back to a, a tank near the front of the uh, um, reactor process. And we may be able to, and probably will recycle uh, supernatant and, and other uh, streams from our sludge processing facility that also impact the process that we have to be aware of. In terms of process control tools, uh, these are our primary tools. The biomass wasting rate, WAS, waste activated sludge. The biomass return rate, RAS, return activated sludge. Uh, aeration, how much aeration we're providing in the basin. Uh, again, we want to be economical there because the aeration system usually accounts for about 50 to 60% of our overall energy use. So we want to make sure we use our aeration system wisely to minimize our operating costs and our energy costs. There are many times that we want to turn off our aerators for a few hours, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. That uh, typically saves energy and also allows us to denitrify uh, under certain conditions. We need to know the HDT, the hydraulic detention time of our basins. It goes back to what I said earlier. We've got to know the volumes of all of our tanks in the process. Mode of operation, if we have a step feed activated sludge process, we can operate it in the step feed mode. We can operate it in the complete, uh, uh, well, that's almost like complete mix by operating in the step feed mode. We're trying to smooth out the organic loading along the length of the reactor, or we can uh, put all of the influent at the front of the reactor and operate in the uh, plug flow mode, or we can put all of the influent at in the last compartment of the reactor and, and then we'd be operating in the contact stabilization mode. And we'll talk more about that later and why we do those things. Again, controlling our recycle streams and control of the influent and how we direct it through the plant is uh, very important. It really helps when you're evaluating an activated sludge process to go see the plan. I occasionally will evaluate a process just looking at data that's sent to me over the computer, but that's not the best way to do it. And you really need to put your eyes on the plant, listen to the plant, smell the plant. And, and there's no substitute for what the human senses will tell you about the process. 
if we have a SCADA system, supervisory control and data acquisition system, that gives us greater capability typically to control the process and uh, gives us a lot of information for, uh, again, process control. The process tests that we use, as I said earlier, there are a lot of process tests. Flow rates, dissolved oxygen levels, pH, temperature, alkalinity, ORP, uh, settleometer, sludge judge, mixed liquor suspended solids concentrations, um, microbial evaluation using our microscope, uh, OUR and SOUR, all of these are important tests that we use conjunctively to tell us what's going on in the activated sludge process. And each of these tests are valuable to us and give us information to let us know what the overall status of our process is. So we rely you know, significantly on these data tests. Now, if you were to ask me, hey, Larry Moore, uh, I'm gonna let you operate my activated sludge treatment plant but instead of giving you the, your whole repertoire of tools that you have, I'm going to tie your hands behind your back and you're only going to be able to use one tool to operate the plant. Well, if somebody told me that, I'd say, give me a, a settleometer and I'll operate that plant and, and probably do a reasonably good job just using the settleometer. Now, obviously, uh, you know, we want to use all the tools in our toolbox and I always like to use the analogy of, if I have chest pains and I go to the emergency room and the doctor comes in and all he does is check the oxygen level in my blood. And then he said, you know, the oxygen level looks so good. It looks good. You, you know, don't worry about the chest pains. You know, I, I'm going to feel like hitting that doctor because I want him to run whatever tests he needs to run to let me know why my chest is hurting. And that's the way it is in activated sludge. We don't want to use just one test, but the settleometer test is really valuable tells us a lot about how the process is performing, how the sludge is settling in the final clarifier, how the sludge is compacting, what our supernatant looks like. And uh, it also allows us to calculate the SVI, the sludge volume index. We take the 30 minute settleability value, which would be in uh, milliliters per liter. We divide that by the uh, grams per liter of mixed liquor suspended solids and that will give us our SVI in milliliters per gram. And ordinarily, we'd like our SVI to be between 50 and 150 milliliters per gram. And I usually like to keep the SVI between 50 and 100. That's generally where we have our best settling sludge. And there are times when we do a diluted settleometer test. I don't think operators take advantage of this test enough. I visited a plant a few months ago where they were running about 4,500 milligrams per liter mixed liquor suspended solids. And I saw their 30 minute sellability values and they were up around 700, 750, 800, 850 milliliters per liter. And I said, hey guys, let's do a diluted settleometer test. And they said, well, what's that? And I said, well, we're gonna take your mixed liquor and we're gonna take uh, some of your secondary clarifier effluent before this infection. And we're gonna mix it half and half and we're gonna rerun the settleometer test. And that allows us to uh, see, uh, you know, what's the impact when they're only settling to 700, 800 milliliters after 30 minutes, that's not good settleability. I like to see the 30 minute settleability be 200, 300, 350. Uh, that's generally where, uh, you know, we have good, good settling sludge and with those results. But if we do the diluted settleometer test and the sludge settles much better that typically means we just have a glutted system. Uh, and that's what they had. We, we did the diluted settleometer, the sludge settled to about 250, much better settling. And they, they just had a glutted system. They were running too high mixed liquor suspended solids. So we just needed to waste more sludge. Now, if we do the diluted settleometer and the sludge doesn't settle better, then usually that's an indication that we have filamentous bulking in our process. The settleability test will give us different information. Don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but there are different uh, settling results that we get and we can look at that data and it tells us a little bit about what's going on in the process. Microscopic evaluation. Again, I can't overemphasize how important this is to use a microscope. Even if you're a small plant, it's good to, to look under the microscope once a day, five days a week, just to see what, what the biomass looks like. 
what the flock shape looks like, what the flock size is. Uh, do we have many filaments or the filaments inside or outside of the flock? Um, so again, the, the looking on the microscope is of extreme benefit. When we do flock analysis, I use the book by Jenkins. Uh, David Jenkins was a uh, professor of environmental engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Jenkins passed away, I believe within the last year, but he wrote a manual, it's called Manual on the Causes and Control of Activated Sludge Bulking and Foaming. It's a big part of my library for evaluating activated sludge. And it's a great book. Uh, he wrote it in conjunction with uh, Michael Richard and Glenn Diger. And uh, again, it's a great resource to help you determine uh, what you can do if you have activated sludge bulking and foaming problems. So here we are, the activated sludge process. Again, the biological reactor and the clarifier, they work together to produce a high quality effluent. Again, uh, the biological reactors, which they were, were most of the stuff that's happening, that's where we get uh, most of the pollutant removal. Uh, and uh, absorption and adsorption in, into the biomass. You go to the secondary clarifier and that's where we hope to get good solid settling. Most of the solids are returned back to the biological reactor and then some will be wasted from the process. And that's primarily, our wasting rate is primarily how we control the activated sludge process. So control methods, primarily four, waste mass. How much waste sludge do we uh, uh, waste from the system each day? And that'll be in, uh, we can measure it in flow rate or measured in pounds per day of solids uh, in our waste sludge, but that's primarily how we control the process. Dissolved oxygen, how much DO we maintain in the biological reactor gives us a little bit of control, uh, but not nearly the kind of control we get by how much sludge we waste. The return sludge ratio is important, it gives us again, a little bit of control of the process, but not nearly as much control as the waste mass. The point of influent application, um, we may not be able to do much there, but if we have a step feed activated sludge process and we've got, uh, then we got some capability to control where we put the influent in the reactor. And again, Step feed activated sludge is the most flexible type activated sludge process you can build. Um, I wish we had more processes like that out in the, uh, in, in the United States, because again, it gives you the operator a lot of flexibility in how he can control his process. And we'll talk more about that later. Well, step feed process. One thing I wanna point out is we're operating in the step feed mode. And in this case, we have basically four compartments provided by the baffling in the basin. We can bring in one fourth of the influent to the first compartment, one fourth approximately to the second compartment, one fourth to the third compartment, and then one fourth to the fourth compartment. And that's how we operate in the step feed mode. We're, we're sort of, uh, you know, smoothing out the organic loading on the reactor. And one thing is important to note that the return activated sludge in this process is always brought back to the front of the, of the reactor. So the return activated sludge is always returned to the front of the reactor. The influent is what's distributed at different points along the reactor. So waste sludge again, waste sludge is, as I said a moment ago, is primarily how we control the process. It has a large effect on the, uh, the characteristics of our biomass, settleability, how the process is operating, uh, the treatment efficiency, effluent quality, degree of nitrification, distribution of, of the types of microorganisms in the reactor. Uh, it just controls everything, how much sludge we waste. Uh, so again, it has a relatively fast effect on sludge quality it controls the entire system. When we say the entire system, again, we're looking at the aeration basin or the reactor, as well as the secondary clarifier and the sludge return line. That's the entire system. So we'll use the waste sludge as our primary control mechanism, and we'll use it to apply pressure to the process. 
we can apply a treatment pressure. If we want to apply a treatment pressure, we will increase the amount of waste mass. If we want to apply an oxidative pressure, we will decrease the waste mass. So what happens when we increase the waste mass and apply a treatment pressure, we're making the uh, more food available to each microorganism. So they're going to grow faster and the sludge tends to be under oxidized. On the other hand, if we decrease the waste mass, it's an oxidative pressure and we tend to have a lower F over M ratio. There's less uh, food for each of the bacteria and the sludge tends to be over oxidized. So we may need to apply a treatment pressure at times. We may need to apply an oxidative pressure at times. It all depends on how our process is operating. We want to know biomass inventory. As, as I mentioned before in the previous presentation, there are basically three or four ways we control the activated sludge process. I think I mentioned four. We can control the MLSS in a certain range. We control the sludge age in a certain range. Uh, we can control the solids inventory or biomass inventory in a certain range, or we can control the F over M ratio, the food to microorganism ratio. The last one is generally the least preferred because we, we wait on the five-day BOD test and then it's too late to, to do anything. So typically we'll have to use COD or TOC as a surrogate measure of BOD to give us a, uh, a more uh, uh, or a quicker value so we can calculate F over M and make some decisions. But normally we'll use the first three, MLSS, sludge age or solids inventory. And as I mentioned before, whichever one of those we're most comfortable with, we can go with it. And that's how we'll operate the process. But when we set one of those parameters, let's say MLSS concentration, then we automatically set the other two. When we set MLSS at 3000 milligrams per liter, then that's gonna determine what the sludge age is, what the SRT is. It's also gonna determine what our solids inventory in the process is. I want you to look at these uh, definitions, uh, show you some calculations, how we can determine uh, how much waste sludge we actually need to waste from the process. Waste biomass, that's the actual uh, dry solids of biomass in pounds per day. ABI, that's the solids inventory in the uh, aeration basin or biological reactor. MCRT, again, mean cell residence time, sludge age, SRT, solid retention time, I use those interchangeably. As I said before, it's like saying soft drink, soda pop, Coke, okay? MCRT, SRT, sludge age. Um, it's all, it all tells us about how long the biomass is in the activated sludge system in days until it leaves as solids in the waste sludge or solids in the effluent. Well, we have intentional waste biomass. That's our waste activated sludge point in the process unintentional waste biomass, that's the solids leaving in the effluent. And if the process is working well, we'd prefer that the unintentional waste biomass be a very low number because if we're losing solids over the effluent, we're the final clarifier, something is wrong. So hopefully the unintentional waste biomass is, is fairly low uh, part of, of, of the biomass leaving the system. The waste sludge flow rate, million gallons a day, again, that's important and typically will be about 0.5 to 3% of our raw wastewater flow rate under most conditions. And then CUC is our clarifier underflow concentration, TSS concentration in milligrams per liter. And typically that'll be in the range of about 5,000 to 15,000 milligrams per liter uh, under most cases. It can be outside that range, but typically 5,000 to 15,000 milligrams per liter. So we want to choose an MCRT or sludge age uh, at which we want to operate at. Uh, the waste biomass will be our aeration basin inventory, solids inventory divided by the sludge age or MCRT. So if we got 10,000 pounds of biomass and the MCRT is 10 days, then our waste biomass is 1,000 pounds a day. If we're... Um, losing, um, if we have suspended solids in the effluent is 150 pounds per day, that's our unintentional 
waste biomass or intentional waste biomass would be the thousand pounds of waste biomass minus the 150 pounds per day that's going out in the effluent. So our intentional waste biomass in that scenario would be 850 pounds per day. Uh, and then the waste sludge flow rate would be the intentional waste biomass and, and pound per day divided by a clarifier underflow concentration in milligram per liter and divided by 8.34. And that'll give us our waste sludge flow rate in a million gallons per day. Dissolved oxygen, again, we can control uh, DO, uh, gives us some control over the process. If we increase DO, we're going to increase the uh, oxidation rate in the process. We'll increase nitrification because the nitrifying bacteria, they are more efficient at higher DO concentrations. And uh, the DO desired in our process depends on the F over M ratio that we're operating at. If we're operating an extended aeration activated sludge system, operating a low F over M ratio, we don't need as much dissolved oxygen. But if we're operating um, a conventional activated sludge process and we're operating at about an F over M of 0.5 or 0.6, we may need two or three milligram per liter of DO in that scenario. So we have to keep in mind, when we talk about DO, uh, you know, there's no specific DO that's correct. It depends on how we're operating, what our F over M ratio is in the process. Now we can also get low DO filamentous organisms. So if we do, one way to solve the problem is to increase our DO concentration. But it typically takes three, once we make a change, it typically takes three sludge ages to realize, you know, a change in our overall process. So if we got low DO filaments and we increase our DO and we're operating at a five day sludge age and three times five is 15, this gonna take us about 15 days before we see a reduction or a washout of these filamentous organisms. We can't wait that long. So what we may do is an emergency treatment with chlorine to kill the filamentous organisms until we get the DO uh, under control and at the desired uh, concentration. Just some uh, microscopic slides here of uh, uh, low DO filaments, type 1701, what it looks like under the microscope. Um, H hydrosis is another low DO filament, and you can see what it looks like under the microscope. Again, the return sludge flow is a way that we control the process, but again, we don't have nearly as much control here as we do with the waste sludge flow. Um, but one thing we do want to do, we want to, if we have four biological reactors, we'd like ideally for each reactor to get one fourth of the influent flow rate. We would also like for each one of those four reactors to get one fourth of the return sludge flow rate. So in other words, we would like to have uh, a fairly uniform distribution of flow and return sludge flow to each of our biological reactors. If we want to apply treatment pressure using return sludge flow, we want to increase the return rate. And if we want to apply an oxidative pressure, we will lower the return sludge flow rate. In most of my dealings with activated sludge processes, and I've vis visited hundreds of treatment plants in the United States, um, most often I see that the return sludge flow rate is too high and uh, needs to be lowered. Not always, but if there's a problem, usually it's too high rather than being too low. Point of application, again, that goes back to where we have a step feed process. Uh, if we want to, we can add all of the influent to the front of the reactor, then it becomes uh, plug flow activated sludge, which is our most efficient type of activated sludge process. The only trouble with operating in plug flow mode, again, we're susceptible to shock loadings, shock organic loadings, and we're gonna send a fairly uh, high loading of solids to the secondary clarifier. So uh, it may be that if we got a step feed system that again, if everything's working well and settleability is under control and, and loadings are fairly uh, steady, then operating with all the influent going in the front of the reactor and things will work great. But if we get a big storm event, we may want to switch and put all of the influent into the last compartment of the reactor and that's applying the uh, 
uh, influent to the tail end of the tank or down the tank. And what that does is it uh, reduces the solids loading on the secondary clarifier and it keeps our biomass inventory in the front part of the reactor. So we actually increase the solid detention time in the reactor by applying the influent to the last compartment in that type of system. So here we are again, take a look at it. Uh, if we're operating in the plug flow mode, we put all of the influent right here and it's going through in the plug flow mode. If we're distributing it one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, we're in the step feed mode. But if we get, again, a, a, a high uh, hydraulic loading, we have a big storm event, our flows go up by a factor of three or four, then, then what we can do to um, alleviate problems in the process is to put all of our influent in the last compartment. And you might say, that sounds crazy. No, it's not. Yeah, we'll still have a detention time here, maybe an hour and a half or so. And uh, by putting all of the influent here, uh, we'll reduce the solids loading on the clarifier. We'll keep them washing out all the biomass that's back in this part of the reactor. And so uh, we'll actually save our biomass, reduce the solids loading, and reduce the impact of the storm event on our activated sludge process. So again, the step feed activated sludge process gives us a lot of flexibility and gives us an opportunity to apply the influent at different points in the reactor, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. So again, if we apply it at the front of the reactor in the plug flow mode, that's a treatment pressure. And again, normally that gives us our best effluent quality. Um, there's a problem with that though, if we operate in the plug flow mode, we're susceptible to high hydraulic loading, we're susceptible to high organic loading. And if we have a bulking sludge, then we're gonna send most of that bulking sludge to the secondary clarifier and, and that may be a problem. So uh, again, we may need to make adjustments and apply the sludge um, further down and maybe even at the end of the uh, uh, reactor. So when we apply it down the aeration tank, Put, put all of our influent in the final compartment of the reactor. That applies an oxidative pressure. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna um, keep the biomass in the front part of the reactor. There'll be less food for the biomass, uh, lower F over M ratio, the solids stay in the system longer. Sludge tends to be over oxidized. So that's an oxidative pressure. And normally we get slightly poor effluent quality, but again, that may help us handle extreme hydraulic shock loads and extreme uh, organic shock loads without disrupting the process significantly. And again, it'll reduce the solid loading on our clarifiers. So we talk about applying a pressure. Uh, again, we apply pressure on the process to either change the quality of the sludge because we don't like the current quality or we'll respond to mother nature because of mother nature uh, doing things to us and mother nature may change the temperature. Mother nature uh, may cause some of our equipment to uh, uh, malfunction. Uh, mother nature may uh, change the loadings, organic or solids or nutrient loadings on our process. Those are things that are beyond the control of the operator and that's why I chalk them, why I chalk them up to mother nature. So what we may need to do is we have a good settling sludge and mother nature does something to us. Something happens to, to change what's happening, you know, and coming into our, our process, then we will apply pressure to respond to mother nature to keep our sludge. We're in a good manageable condition. Uh, and then we also are able to apply pressures related to oxygen and we may be able to use selectors. We'll talk about them in a moment. So again, pressures, Mother Nature, uh, again, winter versus summer temperatures. Usually what we do in the winter, uh, when it's colder, the, the biomass, their metabolic rates are lower. We'll actually maintain a higher solids inventory, higher MLSS, slightly higher sludge age. So we got more microorganisms in the system to get better results. Uh, if our equipment malfunctions, we may have to make changes to respond to that. Um, I help a, a large activated sludge plant, the pure oxygen. Recently, their pure oxygen production facility went out of operation. It was out of operation for three weeks. 
So what we did is we took half of their Unox reactors out of service because what we're trying to do with the oxygen system out, they were having to pay a lot of money to truck in oxygen every day. So we went to as few biological reactors as possible, operated at a very low uh, sludge age. And what we were trying to do is minimize our oxygen requirements. If we operate at a low sludge age, we will minimize our oxygen requirements. And that's where we were trying to respond to uh, the fact that our oxygen production facility was out of service for three weeks. So we applied a pressure to try to keep decent sludge quality, even in a very difficult situation where we were not being able to produce oxygen. So sludge treatment pressure, again, makes the microorganisms grow faster and makes the sludge younger. And oxidation pressure, the bugs grow slower and uh, makes uh, the sludge older. So when we waste and we increase wastage, that's a treatment pressure. When we increase the return rate, it's a treatment pressure. When we apply the influent at the front of the tank, that's a treatment pressure. If we waste less, that's an oxidative pressure. We return less, that's an oxidative pressure. And if we put all the influent at the tail end of the reactor, that is an oxidative pressure. Then we talked about how we can manipulate DO uh, to deal with low DO filaments. And again, there is no desirable DO range. You used to say, well, you need to always operate a two, two and a half milligram per liter DO. Maybe that's what we said 30 years ago. We know that's not the case anymore. We want to operate at the DO level that is best for our system. If we're in an uh, extended air system, that DO may be a half to one milligram per liter. If it's conventional plant with a F over M ratio of 0.6, we may need to operate at three milligram per liter DO. So we have to understand the condition of our system and how we're operating it. And then we may want to operate at zero DO to promote denitrification. And we can use selectors. Selectors are good, especially if you have complete mix activated sludge. We may, and, and complete mix activated sludge processes are very susceptible to filamentous bulking. They're just very prone to filamentous bulking. So in complete mix activated sludge, we can use selectors on the front end of the process. And typically it'll be a small tank maybe a detention time of 15 minutes up to as much as two hours. It just depends on whether we have an aerobic, an anoxic or anaerobic selector. But in the selector, what we're trying to do is create a, a very low detention time, high F over M loading reactor, whereby we select good uh, flock forming organisms for our activated sludge process. So it can be aerobic, Again, aerobic and operating real high F over M ratio to, again, try to control filaments in the activated sludge process. We may have an anoxic selector to, again, control filaments and also to help us denitrify. And then we may have an anaerobic selector, again, to control filaments and also maybe to assist us in biological phosphorus removal. Because I think I mentioned in a previous presentation, the optimal way to get biological phosphorus removal is to have an anaerobic reactor followed by an aerobic reactor. So again, we apply pressures, uh, uh, MCRT, aeration basin inventory, SOUR. We apply pressures. If we apply treatment pressure, we're going to make MCRT younger, uh, the aeration basin inventory lower, and the specific oxygen uptake rate higher. Real quickly, on SOUR, that will be in milligrams of oxygen per hour per gram of MLVSS in the reactor. Typically in conventional activated sludge, that will be in the range of 12 to 20. And for extended aeration activated sludge, usually it's in the range of six to 12 milligrams of oxygen per hour per gram of MLVSS in the aeration tank or in the reactor. So summary then, we'll do visual inspection, we'll gather data, flow rate data, We'll do our field tests on DOPH, temperature, ORP. Uh, we'll collect samples, take them in the lab to run BOD, TKN, ammonia, uh, mixed liquor suspended solids. And we'll look at all of that data and, and make decisions on how we're, we'll apply pressure to the process and, and provide a good managed uh, sludge as excellent settleability and produces outstanding effluent quality 
and we'll make our decisions, implement the decisions, see how well it works, and then we'll make adjustments accordingly. So that's a real quick tour of, of uh, activated sludge process control. I hope you'll go back over those slides as you have opportunity. And again, I thank you for listening today. Hope you have a great day and we'll see you for our next presentation later. Thank you.